Welcome into the best damn college football show out there. I am Drew Martin, Rob Vino, Ralph Michaels alongside. Guys, we are breaking down UNLV, Washington, Washington State on today's show. It's a college football preview show each and every Tuesday morning, 10 a.m. Pacific time. Ralph Michaels, my buddy. Good Tuesday morning to you, man. Hey, uh, Drew, welcome back to Vegas. And let's just mention for those people that don't know the format, we're going through the new coach is in alphabetical order, so we're jumping around a little bit with the UNLV and the two Pac-12 Washington schools. But obviously, uh, Drew, it's exciting to talk about UNLV, seeing we'll be going to a few games this year. Hopefully, there'll be fans in attendance and they'll partake in a cerveza watching the Rebels play. Absolutely. I hope so, man. If, if we get that, uh, I'll definitely take it, Ralph, because that sounds like fun. And have you heard anything about um, which state? Well, I guess we'll get into that with UNLV yeah. in terms of, of uh, the venue of where the Rebels will be playing. But we also have Robbie Vino from SportsMemo.com. Mr. Vino, welcome in, buddy. Welcome to you, too, Mr. Martin. It's a great Tuesday when we all get to sit around and talk college football. Last three teams with head coaching changes that we're going to do next week. It'll be a little different format. I think we're going to uh, the breakdown of schedules conference wise. I don't know. Um, boy, I sent an email a long time ago. I don't know if we agreed upon which conference we'll start in, but starting next week, you'll get full schedule breakdowns of all of the teams conference wise. I know that Ralph and you have provided a quite a bit of schedule breakdown for these 26, 28 teams that we've done so far. Um, but the rest yet to come. So uh, this one will uh, pretty much cover coaching changes, and then we'll go from there to schedule breakdowns. Absolutely. That's uh, next up on the show. But today's show, we got UNLV, Washington, Washington State, ABC order. Guys, you can go back and check the teams before that had coaching changes in ABC order on the Wager Talk YouTube channel each and every Tuesday going back. But let's start off with UNLV, the running Rebels last year, four and eight. Six and six ATS. Marcus Arroyo comes in. Tony Sanchez, I guess you could say, shown the door, Ralph. But uh, overall, you know, an inflection point with UNLV football. Which way are they going to go? Supposed to be playing in Allegiant Stadium. I think you'll know more about that. But how are you feeling this upcoming year with our UNLV running Rebels? Well, you know, Tony Sanchez, of course, was the coach of Bishop Gorman. For those that don't know, one of the premier high schools in the country for football. And they thought perhaps he would get a boost to UNLV. They'd be able to keep those Gorman kids at home. But that didn't work out. Those elite Gorman kids still went to elite programs. You know, and last year they were number 102 in recruiting. That was fifth worst in the Mountain West. Now a Royal comes in with his Oregon, you know, with his Oregon Ducks offense that he ran the last few years. You know, for those that don't know, Arroyo has been with Peterson back. Uh, you know, he was a quarterback coach. I, I take that back. He was only at Oregon 17 through 19, the OC the last couple years. But the biggest thing, be it a Royal, be it the new stadium, only two teams in the Mountain West have a recruit ranking higher than 104. Boise is 65. UNLV is 77. So that is a huge gap that he picked up. He picked up some real talent this year. So when you, Boise is 65, you're 77, and the next best team is 102, that shows you made strides in recruiting. Talking about the stadium, you know, the Raiders are playing those games. We want this, we want this, we want this. And, you know, the, the latest news this past week was, well, if they can move the Colorado State up to a Friday or a Thursday night game on, on November the 7th, then they're going to let them play the the uh, Arizona State game at home. So they're doing all those negotiations and ploys now back and forth. But, you know, I'm sure they're going to be playing at Allegiant Stadium because the Raiders would come off just how horrible would the Raiders look if they build this new stadium? They were supposed to allow UNLV to play, and now they strong arm them. But – you know, I look at the Rebels, and I am not a fan this year. I tweeted out this morning, I'm sure this is the only team perhaps in the last decade who had their 2017 quarterback leader, Aaron Rodgers, on the team. Their 2018 quarterback leader, 
Gillum on the team, their 2019 quarterback leader, Oblot on the team. All three guys are back. And then they get a high profile TCU transfer in Rodgers, who's be ta- who's trying to become eligible. So do we have four quarterbacks or do we have no one that's been able to keep the job for multiple years? So that's the question. But, you know, breaking down UNLV this year, I have them favored in exactly zero games. And that's going to be a long way to go. And what makes it worse, I have them as a dog of 5.5 or higher in every game but one. The only game I have them less than a five and a half point dog is against Nevada in the final because they're at home and they have a bye the week before. But I have Nevada winning the Mountain West. So, you know, I think they're going to be in trouble. So clearly they're an under team for me. Clearly, they're headed in the right direction with their recruiting rank at number 77. You know, the quarterback talent, what, 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 you, what you can say is, you know, a lot of guys. So we'll see if someone steps up. Last year, UNLV had 12.2 returning starters. This year, they have 12. So the number's low. Very high on offense. 80% of the offense back. Only 29% of the defense. That has me thinking going over the total, especially with the new stadium. But again, the the schedule is is just brutal. Why? Well, you opened a new stadium. You wanted to try to take money. So you have home games against Cal. You have a home game against Arizona. You have a home game against La Tech. And your road games at Iowa State, one of the most difficult non-conference schedules in college football. Great breakdown, Ralph. And uh, Robbie, I mean, it, it's tough follow there, but what do you think of this upcoming year? You know, a lot of changes with UNLV, the stadium issue as well, but uh, would, would, do you think they could be undervalued here? I mean, Ralph has them not favored in any games. Well, let's go through the transitions here, um, Drew. Like you say, uh, Marcus Arroyo, new head coach, but a pet peeve of yours, he's also the offensive coordinator. He's also going to call the plays. So for yourself, Drew, you probably don't like this team. Um, head coach coming in heavily involved. In hey, the Rob, offense. can I yeah. can I jump in with you? Sure. He just changed his mind. He hired someone May first, and uh, it's Glenn. It's Glenn Theory, who was the Baylor OC the last couple of years. There you go. So he he did tweak his mind, and maybe because of no spring. Um, but, uh, this guy was at temple in 15 and 16. He was rules. OC. He followed rule to Baylor. He's been there the last couple of years and he was the co-OC the last couple of years at Baylor. So sorry to jump in, but that was breaking news the last few days here. Yeah. And that's important, Ralph, because all along, um, and I hate the fact that I can't see Ralph on my screen cause I can't see when the pen goes up yeah. <laughs> and I know he's got something to say here. Um, Yeah, oh, it's very important. I mean, Marcus Arroyo had, through um, every interview up until now, proclaimed that he would, uh, and he probably still will still have a heavy hand in the play calling. I can't see him giving that up uh, entirely, or at least a heavy hand in the game planning. But his offense, guys, like Ralph um, alluded to, is the Oregon offense. It's a pistol-type spread, plenty of RPOs, and... It's a run-oriented offense. You know, Oregon gets the, or people assume that Oregon, because they're somewhat high-flying, throws the ball more than they run it. But really, ever since Chip Kelly, it's been a run-based offense. It became more of a run-based offense um, the last couple of years because Mario Cristobal, an offensive lineman by trade, wanted it that way. For UNLV, they're in pretty good shape in that department. I mean, returning Charles Williams, who's the best offensive player on the team, team uh, and his 1,279 rushing yards is a good start for Arroyo. At least he should have a good ground game. Maggie are backing him up uh, with 371 yards last year. So it's a good one-two punch. The scheme, it's, it's all over the place with runs. So you get jet sweeps, you get misdirection, you get zone read, you get all of that. I think the interesting part here, guys, and Ralph talked a little bit about the quarterback room for this team. Marcus Arroyo likes to have the QB run integrated into his offense. Just think of Justin Herbert in the Rose Bowl. When everything was going bad, they turned the playbook to the chapter with the QB runs, and Herbert had a monster day running the football. Your choices, as Ralph mentioned, 
Armani Rogers, 6'5", two and a quarter, who's of the bunch. I mean, last year in limited action, five games, he ran the ball, I think, 100 times. 100, uh, I got it right here, 50 times, excuse me, 10 a game for 263 yards. And Kenyon Oblad, the guy who started 11 games last year, not a good runner whatsoever. So which direction will he go uh, with the quarterback here? Will Rodgers get the job back because he's more of a dual threat? Or will we go with Kenyon Oblad? I think it's interesting to note um, the Marcus Arroyo guys, and perhaps we have to dig a little deeper now that there's been a change of heart where the offensive coordinator position is concerned. But Marcus Arroyo's play calling took a lot of heat at Oregon for the first couple of years. I mean, they were not pleased with him. I know some of it was what Chris DeBall wanted to do. Some of it lied with uh, Arroyo's play calling. But last year, after game four, interesting article where they changed their blocking schemes to help the running game. And sure enough, the last nine games of the season, if you go through Oregon's year, all of a sudden the offense opened up again. Those blocking schemes will be brought here. How quickly UNLV can learn all these changes? It's another question. I will say very quickly to Ralph's point about recruiting. This was their highest recruiting class ever in UNLV history. And I think that the new facilities have a lot to do with that probably continuing down the road. I think kids are going to love these facilities. They're going to love the style. So maybe recruiting uh, continues to be very good at UNLV. And despite the fact that it might take them a little bit of time to learn the offense, they'll get more talent on the defensive side of the football. You're going to bring in uh, a guy that, you know, Marcus Arroyo self-admittedly admired uh, when he was coaching against him. Peter Hansen was the inside linebackers coach for the Stanford Cardinal the last few years. The Royals said anytime Oregon played Stanford division rivals, it was a tough test for him. That was the reason for the hire. Hansen has never been a D.C. The last um, job that he held actually um, was only inside linebackers coach. So he's 12 years in the league or 12 years in college football, never a D.C. We'll see how that goes. And he's converting this team to a different front to a three, four front. And we know we've said it a hundred times during these coaching switches that, you know, it comes with position changes. When you go from a four down lineman to three down lineman, linebackers, safeties, defensive ends, everybody gets shuffled around. So this is going to be a bit difficult too for them, but he is a disciple of Vic Fangio. So for guys who follow the NFL and know about Vic Fangio's defense, expect a lot of that here with this team. That's the vision for them. Um, you know, they had a tough break as far as spring season is concerned. They didn't get the practice. They've been doing a lot of the virtual stuff like other teams. Hard to gauge how that's going to go, but I think they really would have preferred to have a little on-field practice for both of these system changes. Sure. Yeah. A, a great breakdown, uh, Robbie. And I mean, when we started talking about, you know, not having spring practices, and who that affects most, it's the coaching changes, at least in my opinion. And Ralph, coming back to you, man, on UNLV, because, you know, as you're talking, I'm looking at this schedule and you're right. It's one of the tougher schedules out there, Ralph. I mean, they don't have a, a FCS opponent. Um, I mean, San Jose State, but that's on the road. It gets really tough to find wins. I mean, this could be an improved UNLV team and not get to four wins, which is what they were last year. I mean, they, they literally could go 0-12 and, and be improved from last year, Ralph. You know, that that's a great point for our viewers, Drew, is because those are the type of teams you want to bet on. When they're winless, when you got an 0-7 team that's much improved and they're playing hard late in the conference season, those are the bettable type teams where I think their ATS record clearly goes up. But, you know, they're in a tough spot. They're trying to draw. They're trying to make. They're trying to make money. And you know, you're looking at a team that has to try to draw people to the new stadium to build excitement. And their 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 schedule for the next few years is brutal because they scheduled Pac-12 foes to come in and play at Allegiant Stadium. So, uh, you know, one thing I will say about the Mountain West is being a new coach in the Mountain West this year is probably the the best advantage or the least worst advantage. There's 12 teams in the Mountain West. Of those 12, there's six new head coaches, 
seven new OCs, and nine new DCs. So you're you're one of those teams that have your same head coach, OC, and DC back. There's only three of them this year. Those teams have an advantage where all the new coaches are going to be fighting to see who can step up the quickest in that role. Wow. I mean, I, it, it, and Ralph, just one follow-up question on where they'll be playing their games. What Do you know the reasoning why the Raiders would not want UNLV playing there? Because I would think it would just be extra money in their pockets. What, what does it really matter to them? Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's not They're not going to hurt the field because if you don't know, the Raiders just planted their new grass field. They're on the trays like, like Arizona, and they put the trays in. But when the when the uh, when UNLV plays, they're going to be playing on AstroTurf, so they're not going to affect the turf. It's not like spots like Pittsburgh, the Steelers, where you have those Saturday pit games and the Sunday Steeler games, and when it's raining, the field's torn up. So you know, I don't know what it was, just the ability to have control of their people and the suites and the timing. So I mean, Colorado. State, you know, if it's a Saturday day game, I, I don't see any trouble in turning it around to a Sunday. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure what what the schedule was so weird for that one game. I don't know if that's the only game that they're both home on Saturday and Sunday. I didn't go through the schedule, but that was the one point they wanted Colorado State to get moved up to allow them to, allow them to host the Arizona State game. Yeah, kind of, kind of weird situation there. I'm sure there's some things they don't want to make public. But uh, either way, great breakdown, guys, on the UNLV game and uh, the UNLV football upcoming season here. And uh, sorry about the technical difficulties here, guys, uh, with the camera. I think we're we're, we're, we're frozen, on, but uh, my, my camera's not working. But either way, we'll get out the information about uh, Washington and Washington State on the back half of this show. And Brian Watson, welcome in on the chat box. He's saying, he's asking a question here. We could go real quick. Uh, Robbie, what are you thinking the ch chances are of college football kicking off on time? If you had to put a number on it, man. I think they're getting stronger every day, Drew. I mean, Notre Dame just announced that they're going to have their student body back on campus on August 10th. Um, I think as we go forward, that's the biggest thing. You have to find ways. And, and all of these, I heard Brian Kelly in an interview, the extensive meetings that they've gone through to try and get this right to be able to have kids on campus again um, really are, are pretty deep <laughs> in thought. And there's multiple contingency plans. So I do think that in some form, whether it be, you know, just power five schools or whether it be a certain amount of conference schools, They'll probably go ahead and, and do it. I think it's getting higher every day. I'd probably say right now it's in that 65% range that you'll see opening day college football. Okay, and Ralph, what about you? If it was minus 110 on each side to see opening day college football, what would you bet, man? Oh, I bet yes that there's some football. You know, we talked about it last week or the week before. You know, if there's no football, let's just shut down the athletics. They already, I think Wofford, Wofford has a $700 million endowment, and they had they canceled baseball this year. Uh, Central Michigan just canceled their track team yesterday. They they stopped their track program just because of money. So, you know, if there's no football, college athletics basically goes away. And I think everyone will do everything they can to stop that. Now, you know, I talked to a friend. We were talking about how much the home field matters in college football if there's no fans. And, you know, he just brought up the point. Well, what if, you know, what if we have week one and – the center of one team comes down with the coronavirus that wasn't detected to the next day. So then what happens? Those two teams are all in quarantine for multiple weeks. So there's still some issues to work out. Yeah, it's an interesting situation. Uh, nothing that anybody here watching the show, uh, all the three of us have ever really seen. But we got Abel also saying UNLV has a long way to get back to competitive status. Looks like, uh, yeah, it might be a long year given that schedule as well, Abel. But thanks for joining us in the chat box. We've got the Washington Huskies up next, guys. Last year, 7-5, and five, both straight up and ATS by, by my numbers. Jimmy Lake in. Chris Peterson out. Uh, last year, Jimmy Lake was the defensive coordinator, Robbie, but uh, looks like new uh, new head coach here, maybe some new blood at the top. You think that's a good thing for the Huskies this upcoming year, man? Yeah, I think it was a little bit abrupt or unexpected, at least on my part, that Chris Peterson stepped down when he did. Um, but regardless, he did. And Jimmy Lake's a guy who's been inside this program for you know, the better part of the decade between 2010, 2020. So uh, he certainly is a guy who, 
is familiar with all the systems, but he's got his own ideas here, Drew, and they don't come on the defensive end. We could start right there. Defensively, he's been the defensive coordinator for this team. Uh, Jimmy Lake and uh, Kwiatkowski, both the uh, defensive coordinator this season, have run this off, uh, run this defense. So there'll be no changes there. You don't have to worry on the defensive side of the football. Even co-defensive coordinator Ikaki Malo has been uh, part of that defensive staff for the last three, four years. So you've got the nucleus there. They're not going to change anything. Washington defensively will be Washington defensively. Jimmy Lake will have a pretty big hand in the game planning, but he won't be the play caller. It's the offense where things are going to turn around here and be drastically different. Um, you know, it, it was a surprise when they made the hire, and the most surprised person of all was John Donovan, the new offensive coordinator. He said he couldn't believe he was the guy chosen for this OC position. He hasn't been in college football since the 2014-15 season. He was, at that time, the offensive coordinator for Penn State. Penn State was still in the recovery process from the sanctions levied on them in 2012. Since that time, he went to the NFL. Uh, he was part of the Jacksonville staff, running backs coach a couple of years, tight ends coach a couple of years. He's bringing in a pro-style system here. Um, and he's going to try and mold a bunch of NFL styles that he learned during the last five seasons at uh, Jacksonville. One of the major focal points here for him is he wants this team to go vertical, or excuse me, yes, vertical rather than horizontal. So we see a lot of teams go side to side in college football. This team wants to go north and south. Here's some quotes from Jimmy Lake. And when you hear these, you'll know exactly what Washington's offense is going to be. Jimmy Lake says, we don't want to run horizontal. We want to run vertical right at people. We want to make them defend that first. Of course, we're going to have some other stuff going sideways but I'm not a sideways type of guy. I want to go north and south in the pass game and the run game. Downhill, physical style, that's what you're going to get out of Washington. And maybe it serves them best this year, guys, because we talked about with UNLV having, you know, a, a quarterback room where you don't really know who's going to be the starter, but you do have experience in their quarterback room. How about the Washington Huskies? They have three total pass attempts in college football in their, in their quarterback room this year. So it might behoove them to run the football first physically downhill if they can do it. Uh, they simplified the playbook this year a little bit because apparently last year the Washington offensive personnel had a difficult time picking up the complexities of Bush Hamden's offense, the XOC. So they made it a little bit simpler. I talked about Donovan trying to mold different styles together. Here's what he's working with. He worked under James Franklin at Vandy and at Penn State. He worked at Jacksonville under offensive coordinator Greg Olson, who happens to be a John Gruden disciple. And then at Jacksonville again, because they've had so many offensive coordinators and system changes the last few years, he worked under Nathaniel Hackett and John Filippo, formerly of the Eagles. Both of those guys mold their offenses around the QB. That's going to be pretty tough to do this year with the youth that they have at the quarterback position. Um, they had no spring practices. Another team affected by that shutdown where they didn't get any chance to see their offensive personnel on the field. They claim that the extra meeting time on Zoom has helped and, you know, position coaches have been able to hammer home some conceptual stuff that's brand new. But, guys, I don't know. If you can't get on the field and learn to execute it and it's a brand new offense, I'd have my doubts. I think Washington um, – you know, just from a projection standpoint, this season looks to me an awful lot like an under team. I don't think they're going to be that successful offensively and defensively. While they remain the same, they should be one of the top defenses in the Pac-12 once again. So maybe an under outlook for the Washington Huskies. Good stuff, Robbie. And yeah, it's always it's always tricky, you know, breaking down that coach speak of like, hey, yeah, we mm -hmm. got it through Zoom, but you got to kind of read through that. You know, that's kind of like just uh, wishing for the positives there. But Ralph, what are you thinking, man? Washington this upcoming year, you know, the whole Chris Peterson thing, I, it's almost like I feel like there was something behind that. Maybe this, you know, there's something wrong in the locker room. I don't know if it was Chris Peterson. I just feel like th that didn't go as smoothly as they're trying to make it make it seem. 
Yeah, you know, he, he left right, right, you know, right before his bowl, Washington against Boise. So, uh, you know, it, it got Washington a bowl win for their coach to leave. And they, you know, they seemed excited when he left. So, uh, you know, I don't have the answers to that. But, you know, the, the things that I got reading after and and Rob hit it right on the nose. Last year's offense was just too complex. They just outcoached the talent. The, the Washington has as much talent as most teams in, you know, in the Pac-12. You know, last year I look at Washington's recruiting rank. They were number 15 in the country. Only Oregon was higher at number seven. This year they're number 16. Only Oregon is higher as 12. So some people don't consider Washington a elite program, but you were 15 and 16 in the country recruiting the last two years. That shows you're getting as much talent as anyone, you know, Sands, Ohio State, Georgia, Clemson, and Alabama, you know, and maybe LSU. Those five are elite. Everyone else in the top 20 is bunched in together. So, you know, they're they're in that Oklahoma range. They're in that Notre Dame range. So, yes, they have plenty of talent. But, uh, you know, I look at them and season was one of the most defined seasons I've ever seen. Their wins were all by tw- – their wins averaged a 24-point win margin – Every win was by 12 or less. Their losses were by four points per game, and their biggest margin loss was 10 points. So every win was a monster win. Every loss was a close loss. And you look at their stat-wise, you know, they were four and five in the conference. They were plus points. 8 yards per game so that puts them at a 500 team so just winning those close winning not winning those close games is what cost them you know here's an interesting fact about Washington I you know I used to love Keith Jackson and when Washington was on national TV and you would see the stadium and you would see the boats coming up and I perceive Washington as just a great home dog in that setting up at Seattle they don't, have, they don't have many opportunities of being a home dog. But the last time Washington won a game straight up as a home dog was 2012. They're, they're 0-7 as a home dog since that point. They're 1-6 ATS. They have not protected their home field like they should. But again, this year, 12 starters back, only four on offense. They are by far the most, the least experienced team on offense. On defense, eight starters back, and they are the second most experienced defense. Uh, You know, I look at Washington schedule-wise, I have them as a double-digit favorite in six games. So that gives them six wins. I have them as a a three-and-a-half to nine-point favorite in one game. Let's put that in the win court category seven. I have them two games between the threes. So if they win one of those, that's eight. And then they're a dog of three times. So, you know, I have them in that eight to nine win range. One thing when you're handicapping the Pac-12, let's remember, nine conference games. So what does that mean? One year you're playing five road games. And this year, Washington is probably playing the toughest road schedule in the conference. At Oregon, the number one team team in the north at utah the number one team in the south at california by far the most improved team in the pac-12 they can win the pac-12 this year then they go at usc we know what usc is the number two team and then at the apple cup washington state we're going to talk about that a little bit in the middle rolovich has a new uh, a new theory on the apple cup to perhaps make washington state more enticing so again this is another other team that, you know, even though they have that eight or nine win, I don't see much of an improvement this year. Um, I think with the offensive numbers and the issues they have with their skill players and quarterback, they're going to be down. I clearly agree with, you know, with an underthought process. Last year, looking at, you know, at their numbers, Washington went eight and five against the spread, four and one as a home favorite. Uh, over under on the year they were six and seven over under. So uh, I have them at eight wins is about right, but we'll learn a lot. I mean, playing Michigan in your opener is tough without a quarterback. Yeah, Washington's going to be a fun one to watch this upcoming year. And looking at the recruiting class, Ralph, you hit on it, man. They 
they got a star as a five star. They they really killed it in their recruiting. So we'll see how fast they can uh, kind of help out the Washington Huskies this upcoming year. Guys, remember three o'clock Eastern time, twelve o'clock Pacific. We got the NFL show. Uh, Ralph, you're a part of it here. Three o'clock uh, on the Wager Talk YouTube channel. Which, which, which uh, division are you guys breaking down? Uh, well, we're doing the NFC North today. We uh, started with the NFC East last week. Mid major. Matt knows the stuff. Prez, again, you know, when, when you're talking NFL, uh, Prez is 